okay, hey there, hey, this is uh, uh, my podcast, and I have uh, Ash Navabi, is that the right way to say it? Yep. Okay, so we were talking online, and I was going to answer you, and then I, quite often if I take the time to answer, I'll post, I'll do a blog post about it because then other people can read it too. So I figured we'd just chat. Um, so you had an interesting question, I thought. Um, anyway, t- tell, uh, where are you? What's your, are you a student or where are you? Yeah, I'm a master's student in economics at George Mason University. Ah, got it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, do you know Dan Roth, Daniel Rothschild? Yeah, I just met him uh, at, in math camp uh, over the summer. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, he's a, he's a buddy of mine. Yeah, I uh, see you guys interact on, on Facebook sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we were in, por- we were, we went to Porkfest to, uh, together yeah. this year. Um, so did you get a chance to read the blog post I sent you? Yes, I did. And, oh. and it clarified things uh, uh, well, um, quite well, a bit, I think. Let's just go through it then. So why don't you read your question, and then um, I'll, I'll tell you what my approach would be, and you tell me if that makes sense or if you have any other questions about it. All right. So the exact question uh, I said was, uh, I'm having a conceptual problem distinguishing uh, intellectual property and tangible property. In Against Intellectual Property, your book, you said that an IP right gives an IP owner quote, invariably transfer uh, partial ownership of tangible property from its natural owner to innovators, inventors, and artists, end quote. Uh, But doesn't this apply to every property right? If I own a tract of land, why can't we say that if I ban you riding across it with your dirt bike, then I am claiming ownership over your dirt bike? Right. And it's a good question. Um... And I think it's 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 based upon several sort of presumptions which uh, are built into the way we commonly talk about property rights in today's society and even among libertarians. So let me let me just kind of systematically tell you my, my approach to that that issue. Um, and the the posts I gave you were about a similar argument that's made, which is that when I point out that the problem with intellectual property is that it limits what people can do with their own already existing property, the common retort is always, but every property right does that. In other words, your property right in your face or in your nose prevents what I can do with my fist, for yes. example. So so they end up trying to twist it back on you and say that all property rights are limits on other people's property rights. And so then I guess the argument is, so what's wrong with limiting property rights? But by, by that argument, you could justify anything. You could justify, you know, someone is uh, attacking someone with no cause, and the victim complains, and you say, "Well, how? What are you complaining about? No property rights are absolute, or something like that." Right. I mean, you, yeah. there's just no end to where you could take that. So you end up invoking property rights as an excuse to limit property rights. It just makes no sense. Um, there's one aspect of intellectual property that actually does make sense, and that is the conceptual uh, – and this is something most people don't understand that aren't specialists. A patent right, for example, um, uh, doesn't give you the right to make the invention that you have a patent on. It only gives you the right to stop other people from making the invention. So for example, if I patent a um, – uh, let's say someone has a patent on a four-legged stool. Okay, so they, they are the only one who has the right to make that stool, or they can prevent other people from making a four-legged stool. And you come up with the bright idea of making a three-legged stool. Okay, Now let's suppose their patent is um, a stool having a, a, a plurality of legs, something like that. So that's their patent. It's a broad patent. Then you come up with a patent for a three-legged stool because it's more stable and it, you know, it doesn't rock back and forth if one leg is different than the other or whatever. You might be able to get a patent on the three-legged stool, but you wouldn't be able to make the stool because that might infringe the first patent. Okay, So the point is a, a, an IP right doesn't really give you the right to do something. It gives you the right, the right to stop other people from doing things. And in a sense, I think that's what regular property rights are too. Um, for example… If I say I own the right to a handgun, it doesn't mean I can do whatever I want with the handgun. It means that I I am the one who has the right to control it. I am the one who has the right to give permission or to deny permission from other people. I can loan someone my gun. I can sell someone my gun. I can give someone my gun, or I can prevent them from using my gun. So in a sense, property rights are like a negative right. It's just I'm the one who can prevent other people from crossing that boundary. 
Um, right. It's not an absolute right to do whatever you want with it. Now, the way libertarians put this usually is they'll say you have the right to use your property in any way that you want so long as you don't harm someone else. They'll, 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 they'll put that sort of limitation on it, and that's functionally the same thing, but – in reality, you never had a right to use your fist to punch me in the nose. You never had a right to use your gun to shoot me. You never had a right to use your motorcycle to ride on my property because mm -hmm. the right to the motorcycle is simply a right really in abstract form. It's a, it's a right to prevent other people from using that motorcycle. But that So that right, that negative right, would never have given you a right to cross mm -hmm. over my land in the first place. So that's yeah. like legally how I would conceive of that in the first place. Is this is this related to the notion of estoppel? No, it's got nothing to do with estoppel. The, estoppel is more like just a, a way to justify the libertarian rights framework that we have. So that's a total. This is more just analytical, like analyzing what rights are. Okay. Um, a, another aspect of that type of analysis is uh, sort of the Rothbardian combined with say Mises and Hoppe, the recognition that uh, number one, all rights are property rights. Right? Rothbard points this out in Ethics of Liberty, but. He doesn't dwell too much on what that means, and this is uh, – if you unpack that with reference to Mises' praxeology and Hoppe's uh, political theory, what that really means is that all rights are property rights, and all property rights are property rights to control a contestable, scarce resource. I mean that is what property rights are. Because if you think about it, all property rights or an assignment of an exclusive right to use or in my negative way, the right to pre prevent other people from using something that there could be conflict over, and they're potentially enforceable. That is backed up by force. So all these things are bound up in the physical world. We use physical force, maybe backed up by the legal system or the community or even yourself in terms of self-defense or self uh, you know, uh, action that uh, protects your, your, your the resource you want to use. Um, so – all enforcement of rights is physical force. They're always aimed at a real conflict. The real conflict is always a, a physical squabble over some real thing. So property rights just are a right to a physical resource. So when it comes to intellectual property, what I think I, – I think it's literally impossible to own an idea, for example, or a recipe or information. It's not just that I oppose it morally. It's not just that I think the, the legal system is unjustified or socialistic. It is that it literally is not what it claims to be. It is not a, a – le no legal system in the world can actually grant property rights in ideas because all property rights are rights to re scarce resources. So it's basically a disguised way of reassigning property rights in existing things that can be the subject of property rights. So just as a crude example, if you own a copyright in your novel – what that really means is that the law is granting you a legally recognized right in some of my money. Yeah. Right? Because you can go to court and the court will use physical force against my physical body to compel me to pay you some money or to compel me not to print on my paper some story. So really it it, it amounts to a reassignment of rights. Now, you could say, well, all property rights are just the ownership of some resource by an owner, and therefore intellectual property is no different. And that is true. It's just that the property rights are not assigned in a just way. So the libertarian view is we have a set of basically three and exactly three and only three rules for determining who the owner of a resource is. And this is where estoppel might come into it if you wanted to go to a justification or argumentation ethics or consequentialism. Or, or intuitionism, whatever your approach is, or you know utilitarianism, the basic set of libertarian rules is number one: uh, uh, the idea of uh, well, in a way, there's four because I was going to say original appropriation, which is if there's an unowned resource, then the person who is the first one to start using it and put a borders around it, basically, uh, to establish a connection between them and the thing. By mixing their labor with it, for example, you might say that person has a better claim than anyone else. Okay, it, unless the one of the other two things happen, which is contract or or retribution or restitution, uh, rectification. Um, yeah, the, sort of the parallel to that rule is self ownership. That is body ownership. You also have a, a presumptive right to control your body. That's not really original appropriation because your body wasn't like lying around unowned and you homesteaded it. So there's a different basis, in my view, for your ownership of your body. But so you could say that libertarianism has four rules. Number one is body ownership, presumptive body ownership. Mm 
-hmm. Everyone owns their body because they have a better claim to the body than others because you have direct direct control over your body. That's sort of the hobby and analysis. But in terms of external resources that were unowned, we have three rules. One is original, like Lockean original appropriation. Yep. Uh, so the first owner, the first user has a better claim than others unless you, as the owner, transfer ownership to someone else by a rental agreement or a contract or a sale or a gift or a donation something like that. So basically you you can transfer ownership to someone else and then that person would be the best owner of the thing with regard to the rest of the world because from the rest of the world's point of view this person has a uh, no one else is an earlier user of the thing. The only person who's an earlier user would be you, but you contractually gave it to them. So you don't have a claim against them either because of your particular contract. And then the third case would be a case of like if you harm someone in some kind of crime or tort, then you owe them compensation, uh, rectification, or re restitution. Uh, in such a case, someone might have a claim on some of your resources uh, in compensation for the harm you had done them. Um, but using those three rules, you can identify the owner of any scarce resource in the world. And in, in the motorcycle case, in the land case, you can't just say uh, – uh, uh, the owner of the motorcycle has a complaint against the landowner because he can't use his motorcycle to ride on the land because the question is, what's the disputed resource? In this case, the disputed resource would be the land, right? Because the motorcycle owner wants to ride it on the land. So now we have a dispute between two possible people over the ownership of this land. Who gets to use the land? It's irrelevant that the, there's a motorcycle involved. I mean, you might want to walk on my land with your body. You might want to shoot cannonballs into my land with from your from your land, you know, with your with your artillery. Um, you want to use my land in some way. You want to alter the physical integrity of my land in some way. I don't want you to. So we have a conflict over a scarce resource, which is what property rights always are about. And so the libertarian approach is to consult those three principles: who was the first owner of the land, who acquired it by contract, and, or and does anyone owe anyone rectification for some kind of tort they've committed? Okay. Now, in the example you gave, I'm assuming that the landowner hasn't harmed the motorcycle owner. He hasn't committed any tort against him. He hasn't stolen anything from him. He hasn't invaded his, his property borders uh, in some kind of way, so he doesn't owe him any kind of recompense. Um, he didn't have a contract with him. He didn't say, I give you the land, so there's no contract. So then the question comes back to who has the better title to the land? And presumably, if I'm the owner of the land, I either was the first homesteader of the land or I acquired it by contract from someone else. So the question is answered by resort to those principles. So I'm the owner of the land. And so that's the libertarian approach. The only other approach would be some deviation from those rules, which is what socialism always does. Basically, socialism always ends up endorsing a rule um, that the current owner of a resource um, – is the th the three rules I mentioned plus another rule um, unless we the, – the democratic majority or unless the dictator decided to take this from the, the existing owner, which is theft. We just call that theft. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's no conflict between property rights, and the two blog posts I sent you um, is an attempt to explain why there's not a conflict between – uh, well, why property rights are not limits on property rights. Property rights actually are the assignment of the right to decide who gets to use um, a given resource. Anyway, that's my attempt to explain that issue. Yeah, that was very good. Um, uh, does that persuade you? Do you do you agree with that? Does it make sense? No, I yeah, one hundred percent agree with that. Um, to me, it was just when I was reading your book, it was unclear where you were going um, with that passage. And I understand now that you said uh, uh, a property right is um, uh, somebody asks uh, is, is conflict over a scarce resource. So we, we have to understand what is the resource being uh, uh, conflicted over. And in the case of uh, the motorcycle and the land, it was the piece of land. And in the case yes. of IP, it's usually some scarce resource. Yeah, it's, it's, it's either the, the or body whatever. or the warehouse or the material yeah. of, of the person who's being limited by the IP law. Exactly. And, and in terms of libertarian theory, my view is that um, the nature of conflict and the nature of disputes is what helps to identify what the resource is. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a question unless there's a conflict, 
And when there's a conflict, then there are two people who want to use something in an incompatible way, right? They have a dispute about it. And that very, that very dispute usually highlights the, the nature of the thing that's in question and helps to identify its boundaries and what the resource is. And in this case, I, I would say it was the land. It wasn't the motorcycle. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, all right. Was there anything else? Um, Are you yeah, reading this as part of your part of your economic studies, or just for just so, for libertarian so this fun, what, or what? Uh, this is what led me to read it again uh, right now. Um, so one of the classes I was taking this semester is a course called Economic Systems Design, okay, uh, which is uh, about matching theory and auction theory. And um, my term paper for that class is uh, is uh, I'm, I'm writing a paper on designing a market for trade secrets. In mm -hmm. a world without intellectual property. Okay. So the the mechanism I came up with is uh, someone comes up with a secret idea. They're an inventor, and they go to an auctioneer mm -hmm. who evaluates the idea. And then when once they evaluate the idea, they uh, they they have uh, they try to entice other firms to bid on this idea by uh, giving just a hint of what the idea is. Mm-hmm. 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 Um. Uh, let me mention one other thing, and then I'll, I have some comments on that. Um, you might also look – if you go to c4sif.org on my resources page, yeah. I've got a couple of pieces by Roderick Long, um, like his original like 1995 or so article, uh, The Case Against Intellectual Property. And then he's got another one which is explicitly titled like Owning Ideas Means Owning People. And he makes the point in both of those. Uh, he makes a similar point that I did, and Tom Palmer does too in the article I cite. Um, that IP basically is a reassignment of rights. It means own, having property rights in other people. Mm -hmm. It's similar to what Rothbard's argument was in his defamation when he argued against defamation and um, libel and slander law in his art of, in his chapter in um, Ethics of Liberty uh, on knowledge, true and false, where he points out that if you own your reputation, right, which is what libel and slander and defamation law protect, uh, and which Randians, for example, are in favor of reputation rights. It basically means owning what other people think because your reputation is what other people think about you. So you, you in effect, have a property right in other people's brains. Right. Uh, and IP law has a similar uh, logic to it. To, to really grant IP, you have to basically have rights in other people's bodies, um, and that's literally true. I mean there are cases where people have been prevented from singing a song or – uh, there's been a threat to someone who has a tattoo that has a copyright on the tattoo, like on their uh -huh. face. Like yeah. there, there's a potential threat they may have to get the tattoo taken off their face. I mean, all kind of crazy things like this. So it doesn't just affect tangible resources, which is bad enough. Um, but on your question about the trade secret issue, um, well, in economics, uh, you should maybe look into uh, – you probably read some Bon Bavirk and others. Um, there is there is a heavy reliance by economists on – legal pre presumptions they assume some legal background usually the existing legal order or something like our legal order um and they don't always justify it and that's fine but they take for granted lots of things they take for granted the nature of contract for example they take for granted that there are contracts that are enforceable and sometimes they take for granted intellectual property right and the trade secret case if you assume there's no intellectual property we're talking a contractual world then you need to be real careful about what you think of what you mean by contract, and for that, I would have I would highly recommend you uh, read Rothbard's um, contract theory. And my I have a longer article elaborating on that. The libertarian view of contract is not that it's binding promises; it's just an alienation of transferable title to owned resources. That's mm -hmm. all contract is, uh, and that does have some implications for theory uh, and how you integrate it with legal theory. And also, if you were a practicing IP lawyer. You would you would actually have some awareness of the actual ways people do the trade secret thing right now because even now under today's law there is trade secret law but if the if the secret becomes public you're still screwed right mm -hmm. and the law doesn't even protect that once it gets public it's not a trade secret anymore it's not a secret it's got to be a secret to be a trade secret um, and so there are techniques that people actually do use right now that are similar to what you're talking about I don't know all the details you'll have someone approach a company. And they want to show a little bit of what they have, but yeah. they can't show too much because you might get it might get quote unquote stolen, which I think is right. the wrong word, but you know what I mean. 
But yeah, you could imagine creative ways that you could do this. So if you have a an idea, is it more of an entrepreneurial idea or an economic idea or a techno- technological idea or, or, or what? So this was the uh, – I'm just trying to imagine a world where uh, right now people, they patent their uh, – their inventions or get a patent pending thing and then they they license their idea yes to corporations well if there is no such thing as patents let alone patent pending and you do invent something how do you still make money off of it my solution was you have a trusted auctioneer who evaluates um, inventions yeah and then that auctioneer then goes and um, gets the firms interested in to bid and there are problems because he's he's got a lot of uh, uh, power. Yeah, uh, he's, he's got a lot of uh, options to cheat the the inventor to like just sell his idea um, just to one corporation as opposed to putting it up for auction. Right. But I still think uh, if you put something up for auction, you're likely to get a higher price. So there's a the countervailing. So is the idea that that um, all you're giving to the winner is the the right to be first to market basically and you exactly. you assume it's going to become public pretty soon anyway well the the way i set it out would be the uh the identities of everyone involved in the auction would be anonymous yeah so uh no one knows who the inventor is and no one knows who the, all the other firms bidding are so in that sense um if, no but i mean what, what what are you selling them actually what, what do they get if they win the auction they, they just, get they get they get the invention they get the actual invention they get, they get informa- an information they, dump they from get you. the information but uh, the, uh, by making the uh, auction anonymous, uh, n- the inventor doesn't know who got the invention, so they can't go around to other firms trying to sell their invention. Because if they do, and they try to sell to uh, the firm that they uh, sold it to already, then that firm can complain, and then they could uh, damage their reputation. Well, and you could imagine a con- you could have a contract. If you're going to do it that way, you could have contracts too. In other words, the the seller of the information is agree is going to agree to sign a non-disclosure agreement or some kind of contract where they obligate yeah. themselves not to reveal it to anyone else either. And you if they do, they could be sued. You for could, sure. Yeah. Um, but again, this is that's presupposing um, other legal systems, et cetera, if you, even if you don't assume that you did sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, okay. Yeah, you could do it with reputation. I don't see any reason yeah. why you would need to rely only on that, but um, – but you, since you brought it up, this, um, I've also been confused on uh, on non disclosure agreements. You said before it has nothing to do with IP. Can you can you go into detail why? Well, I, what I've said is that uh, uh, the contracts uh, some some proponents of intellectual property imagine that you could have some kind of agreement between the seller and buyer of a product that that basically creates a type of intellectual property. I don't know if they're talking about a non-disclosure agreement or some other type of agreement. They're really talking about a non-copy agreement, not necessarily a non-disclosure agreement because in most cases, the the information that constitutes the proprietary design or, or, or aspect of the ideal object, you could call it, is public anyway. So for example, if I, if I sell you my novel, you're, first of all, you're not my only customer. I've got millions of customers or thousands. So the book is out there in the public. So a non-disclosure agreement wouldn't make any sense because the there's nothing for me to keep secret. If you sell me a book, what you want me to do is a promise not to copy it mm-hmm. or maybe promise not to sell it to anyone else, like even the same book, you may, like no, no resales. Of the book. I don't know. Or if you sell me a car that has an innovative uh, you know, fuel injector design – you want me to promise not to reverse engineer the car and or promise not to copy the car and or promise not to make make cars that are too similar to that or something like that. So it's just a contractual limitation on what I can do going forward. It's not a non-disclosure agreement because, again, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the information is going to be widely available to others. So the argument that IP advocates make is that even though the information is public, like the, the 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 plot of the novel, or the text of the novel, or the or the or the uh, the, the design used uh, in the fuel injector of the car, even though it's publicly known, no one no one in the world can copy it without the permission of the inventor or the author, because the 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 originator of the of the idea sold it to a limited number of people, and every one of them he sold it to on the condition that they couldn't copy it. 
And therefore, no one else that got the information out there got it in a legitimate way, so they couldn't use the information either. But that's the fallacy in the argument right there is, is that the argument uh, makes the assumption that information is ownable. If mm. information is not ownable, then this contractual scheme could only bind the, the limited number of initial people um, that the objects, the physical objects embodying the design were sold to, the, the, the buyers of the book or even the people who downloaded the book. If they agreed on Amazon, they clicked the box and they said, I agree not to copy this. Okay, arguably they're bound by contract, and if they copy it, they could be sued for contract breach. But the problem is third parties are not bound by contract. Um, and once the information becomes public, people who have access to or are aware of that information are free to use that information to guide their own actions with respect to their own resources. Uh, there's no contractual privity, we call it. There's no contractual tie whatsoever between those third parties and the owner, um, or, I'm sorry, the the inventor or the author at all. So that the pro that's the flaw in that argument, in in, in my view. And Rothbard makes that makes that mistake in uh, the chapter where he talks about he he rejects patent, but then he says something like copyright could work because you, you know I sell you a book, but that's I reserve the right to copy, or I sell you a mousetrap, but I res I give you the right to use the mousetrap, but I reserve the right to copy. So you don't have the right to copy, and therefore no one else who observes the mousetrap could get the right to copy because you didn't have to give it to them. So it's a bizarre argument that in, 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 in effect rests upon the presumption that information is ownable, which is what IP says. So it's, a, it's totally question begging. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just assuming information is ownable to prove that information is ownable. Yeah. So you're saying um, uh, just a strict non-disclosure agreement that uh, you and I agree to discuss a certain idea on the condition that neither of us outside of this context will reveal uh, the, 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 uh, in the specifics of the discussion to anyone else. Yeah. You're that's enforceable in court? Absolutely. I, I see no problem. Uh, but enforceable simply means that um, the contract – breach, there's – there's a uh, restitution. There's a it, there's because all property rights are rights in scarce resources. All contracts are just the exercise of ownership of a resource of, of by an owner of his ownership of a resource. Um, all contracts are ultimately a, about assigning title to property in those resources. So, the right way to understand a non disclosure agreement is it's really a conditional transfer of title. It's it's basically me saying, um, like a, a preliminary statement, just a statement. Like my intention is to keep this secret. My intention is to respect your confidence. If I don't, then I owe you a million dollars or something like that. So it's really – the whole contract is really a transfer of title to money, uh, conditional. It's a conditional future Transfer of title to uncertain, uncertainly existing money in the future based upon a condition that you uh, uh, violated a confidence or something like that. Um, that's the right way to look at it. In, in, the, in the law and economics literature, by the way, there's something similar. It's called the efficient breach theory. You might want to look yeah. that up, um, which is from a different basis, but it basically says the same thing. And it's, it's, the, it's this idea that we shouldn't have uh, allow punitive damage awards or we shouldn't. We should basically allow people to breach contracts if they're willing to pay the damages to the other party because then everyone's better off. Yeah. Um, something like that would apply to the Rothbardian theory, I believe, because it's really always, always about – except I think in the Rothbardian theory, in libertarian theory, you would permit punitive uh, clauses. Uh, the efficient breach theory is used by law and economics types, basically, if I'm remembering this right, to say that um, clauses and contracts. So contract contracts often have um, uh, damage clauses because you want certainty. You you don't really want to just throw it to the court to the judge and just uh, assume he'll come up with a damage uh, for breach of contract. You want to specify, okay, if you breach the contract, here's how we're going to compute the damages. Okay, so people, careful lawyers will sometimes do that. However, sometimes they'll say you owe me 
10 times or three times um, the following metric. And the courts will say, well, that's, that's looking punitive. You're actually trying to punish them, and they distinguish between criminal, civil and criminal law. Civil law is about damages and property rights. Criminal law is about punishment. And if you allow private people to put a punitive damages award in their contract, you're letting them have a criminal aspect to their thing, and that's not permitted. And the and the uh, the efficient breach theory, I think, is one of the arguments used against that. In my view, you can contract for whatever you want. Like if you know, if you sell me, if, if you tell me a secret, and I agree to pay you ten million dollars if I breach the secret, even though it's a trivial thing, then I owe you ten million dollars. It's a lefor- it's an enforceable contract because I own the I own the money. I have the right to give it to you for whatever reason I want. I can give it to you as a gift. I can give it to you in exchange for something of similar value, or I can give it to you in exchange for whatever, any condition I want. I can, I can say, I can, we can gamble. I can say, I hereby give you ten million dollars tomorrow if it rains in South Africa. I mean, whatever I want, as long as it's definable and and it's 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 it's, um, it's a meaningful communication that 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 uh, that we can understand whether the condition was triggered or not. Then it should be it should be enforceable, mm-hmm. but what I, the other thing I was going to say is there are different types of um, so you were trying to use this trade secret idea to emulate a, a little bit of what's done now with say patent licensing. See yeah. with patent licensing though, you, I could license it to five or ten different people like a non-exclusive license. In your kind of simple sim, simpler model, you're you're imagining a one-off kind of thing, but there could be different type of trade secrets. There, you, you, what you could say is. Um, I'm going to license this to, to only five people, right? Maybe I'll license it to you this year. Maybe next year I'll, I'll license someone else or whatever. But for me to license it the second time, it's got to still stay secret. So part of the bargain would be we're going to have an auction. Whoever wins um, gets a, a data dump from me. I tell them how to do A, B, and C. And then I make a contract with them, and I promise not to re- reveal it to anyone else except the people that I have the right to. And you promise to keep it secret. That's where the NDA would come into play. That's why companies use non-disclosure agreements. They use them in part to keep the trade secrets secret. So if it's a type of um, secret that is not going to be um, revealed by the sale of the product, and some secrets are like – some secrets are processes, like it's how you make the product. Mm-hmm. And so you don't necessarily when, – when you sell the product that comes out of that process, you don't always reveal to the world – the nature of the trade secret. Some things you do. Some things, if you sell, you know, the new Apple iWatch, uh, or, or you sell the iPhone, for example, you can't have a trade secret in the idea of a touchscreen and a rectangular shaped phone because that's apparent in the device that you're selling to everyone. So you couldn't keep that as a trade secret anyway. Some things you could, if they have a special technique for making the iPhone, and they want to keep that secret. Uh, that's fine, and they could license that to other people contractually, and they could license it to multiple people, multiple people, as long as they have a good agreements and relationships with with all those people, and everyone keeps a secret. The more people you license it to, of course, the higher the likelihood is you're going to finally have a defector. Yeah. But in any case, um, there are things you can play with in 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 in, 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 in analyzing how trade secret or similar arrangements could work in an ip free world i think it's an interesting topic thank you um yeah there's um lots of issues to explore um for me the biggest issue is just uh how do you trust the auctioneer to to keep the secret um i don't know if that would be a, if you imagine this is a, a viable business model then you would have yeah. auctioneers that would emerge in the market that have reputations yes for sure but uh, I'm looking at um, like real world auctioneers. That's uh, that's basically Sotheby's and Christie's. Right. And they and they basically um, oligopolize the market as oh, happens in most markets, right? Right. So uh, stuff I read on uh, on traditional auctions, uh, auctioneers tend to it, their biggest barrier to entry is just reputation. It takes a long time to build a, a trustworthy reputation. Well, you know, there's there's something similar that actually happens right now. It's it's like a, a software escrow. You ever heard about that? No. So, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a. I've done this a few times in my past, and I'm trying to remember a real world context. So, let's say some company has software. Yeah. Now, the software is protected by copyright 
but quite often they'll keep some of it secret. It's got trade secret aspects to it, okay? Um, the source code is not revealed, only the executable, if I'm remembering exactly right. In any case, let's say I need a loan uh, or I need um, – so I'm a company. I sell software. I need a loan. One of my assets is my software, my trade secret in the software. Uh, so the company giving me a loan has that as collateral, which means if I default on the loan, they can seize these assets. But if I go bankrupt, you know, all the employees might run off, and there's going to be no one left around who can explain to them what the software secret mm -hmm. was. So sometimes the, uh, the lender will insist that I put that software in escrow. I don't want to give it to the… I don't want to give it to my lender, my creditor, because I don't want them to have the information. They don't, they, they don't have the right to have the information unless I default on my on my loan. So there are there are there are agents out there there I just Google software escrow and yeah. you can actually give this code to an escrow agent and they hold it in confidence and with with a contract specifying that you you keep this secret and you destroy it, you know. After, after ten years, if I, if 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 the if if I call you and tell you, look, the deal's over, just destroy the information. They destroy it, or they'll return it to me, or whatever. But um, if, like, a judge tells them the company has defaulted on their loan, and, or they're bankrupt, or something like that, then you can release it to the creditor. So there are actually software escrow and similar type of escrow. Um, Agencies and institutions that exist right now, they, and this is an actual actual business. And and there there's uh, it, it's like a normal market people. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty nice. rare because you have to have a, a rare set of circumstances to afford this and to do it. But it's it's not that rare. It happens. The closest thing I could think of um, to a real world version of this is uh, uh, those storage wars type situations. You've seen that TV show? Storage wars, no. It's uh, uh, it's abandoned storage lockers, and people have uh, auctions over these. Ah, uh. so it's the TV show is just uh, they they go up to this storage locker and there's a padlock on it, and then the owner <laughs> uh, of the storage warehouse chops off the uh, the padlock and opens the door either slightly or all the way and doesn't turn any of the <laughs> lights on, and then a whole bunch of people gather around. And then all they can do is look from the outside what's inside, and it's usually just a bunch of boxes and uh -huh. shadows. Uh -huh. And then, uh, and then just from the shadows, then they start bidding. And then <laughs> That's some, sometimes the bids are just like a couple hundred bucks. Sometimes they go up to a thousand bucks. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, there's well, I guess you could do something similar with safety deposit boxes too that are unclaimed or something. Yeah, I could see something like that. Um, actually, in the law, at least in the civil law, like if you look in Louisiana civil law. There's a doctrine called sale of a hope, which I, which mystified me. When I loved it. It's such a sale of a hope. You can sell a hope. It's like a chance. You can sell a chance at something. Okay. So, for example, if I if I think and I, if I'm remembering right, this would be covered by that. So, I own a locker, which the contents of which are unknown. No one knows what it is, and I'm I'm selling it to you. I'm saying, uh, I'm going to sell you whatever's in this locker for a thousand dollars. So you're buying a hope in a sense, right? And I'm selling you a hope. That's that's the way the law classifies that, right? It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, and it's got. Why does it have a special name? Or is it, I don't I don't remember why it arose. Uh, if you look in the Louisiana Civil Code, it might give uh, there might be some examples as to why. There's another doctrine in the in sales in civil law. It's called sale of uh, sale by lump. So for example, if I want to sell you my truckload of turnips. I don't really know how many turnips are in the truck. I mean, I could sell you, you know, fourteen thousand turnips, or I could just say, I'm selling you the turnips in the truck. The lump of turnips in the truck, truck is what you're getting. Yeah. So that's sale by lump. That's another separate uh, legal doctrine for that particular circumstance. The sale of the hope, I can't remember offhand the examples, but it's an interesting thing, and it probably would cover something like that. It's got yeah. to do with things in the in the future that you don't know what's going to happen. Which is basically what all future contracts are. They're all aleatory, as they say in the civil law. They're all based upon the future and uncertain. Anyway, it's far field. But anyway, um, anything else? Uh, I think that covers everything. Thank you so much. All right, cool. Well, good luck at school, and uh, we'll, we'll chat later. For sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man.